Good morning. My name is Mitch Tannenbaum, and today we'll be talking about protecting controlled unclassified information. This is a new activity on the part of DOD, uh, even though it's something that should have been done years ago, and there's uh, new controls going into place, actually technically effective of December 31st of last year. My name is Mitch Tannenbaum, and I'm a partner in the cybersecurity consulting firm called Cybersecurity. We are a full-service cybersecurity firm based in Denver, Colorado. We offer assessments, mitigation, incident response, and education. Today's webinar is about education. According to General Alexander, dating back to 2012, U.S. companies lose about $250 billion a year through intellectual property theft. Um, that was compared back in that time to $100 billion due to other cyber crime. So at that time, it was about twice as much being lost to intellectual property theft uh, as cyber crime. While the cyber not crime numbers have gone up in the last five years, so have the intellectual property theft uh, losses. Uh, Robert Mueller, former director of the FBI, uh, said uh, very famously that there's really only two kinds of companies. Those have been hacked and those that will be hacked. And even those are converging into one kind, ones that have been hacked and ones that will be hacked again. Our goal is to make it difficult for the bad guys to hack you. The loss of industrial information, intellectual property theft through cyber espionage, and we're talking about countries like Russia, China, um, and Korea, North Korea, um, you know, is uh, the greatest uh, transfer of wealth in the history of man. If you think about it, you know, the F-35 fighter is one of the pieces of, of quote, information that the Chinese stole, right? Uh, we spent billions or tens of billions of dollars building them and designing them. They just knocked it off. And now they're building their own F-35s and they're attacking us if we went to war with our own design. So one of the things we've done historically is we have gone off and um, air-gapped computers, especially classified computers, but anything that's sensitive, for example, the control room in a nuclear power plant. Um, but what we're seeing is that uh, with things as simple as uh, a, a cell, cell phone or as complicated as Brutal Kangaroo, uh, the FBI's activity in terms of doing the same thing, we are able to compromise even air-gapped networks. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't air-gap networks. It's way, way, way more difficult to compromise an air-gap network than a non-air-gap network, but it just says that nothing is foolproof. So let's look at some recent news here. Uh, first thing is, um, you know, if we go look at our typical defense acquisition project, you know, they look at cost, schedule, and performance as the three factors that they weight uh, competing vendors against. Um, the in in light of what I'm going to talk about in a second, the Pentagon has gone off and said, you know, maybe we ought to go rethink that because this isn't working so well for us. And what they're talking about doing in a program called Deliver Uncompromised, which has been developed by MITRE, is that uh, we're going to use security as a fourth leg on that stool and turn it from a three-legged stool to a four-legged stool and make security equally important to cost schedule and performance. If that happens, then your security scorecard is going to be a factor in terms of whether or not you win or lose uh, a contract. So... Two recent events, one that was in the news in terms of um, uh, news that hackers had breached uh, 100 nuclear and other power plants just this year. That was 2017. Um, the other, though, is a probably more important thing when it comes to this whole protecting defense information, and that is that um, the Chinese are accused of... Um, hacking a Navy contractor at the uh, Naval Undersea Warfare Center in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and stealing massive quantities of highly sensitive data related to a program called Sea Dragon, supposedly. Secret program, they're not saying much about it, but uh, supposedly the uh, program was an effort to build supersonic anti-ship missiles for use on U.S. submarines. Um, according to 2020, or uh, around, by 2020. 
what was taken was about 600 plus gigabytes of data relating to this closely held product project called Sea Dragon, uh, and that includes uh, signal data, sensor data, submarine radio room data, uh, information relating to cryptographic systems, and uh, submarine electronic warfare uh, information. So this is a, a pretty major breach. Um, and while nobody's saying anything, um, this is likely the cause of some activities that are going on right this very minute. Uh, the FBI puts out uh, ind industry notifications. They're called PINs, private industry notifications, on a regular basis. This particular PIN is talking about advanced persistent threat, which is uh, you know kind of a code word for the most part uh, for China and Russia. Um, and it says they're targeting cleared contractors. And if you think about it, it's pretty hard because of the air gaps to get to the classified networks. Um, not impossible, but difficult. So they're going after the sensitive unclassified networks. And that's where we're talking about today and why they're doing what they're doing. So what is the solution to that? Well, the solution is uh, an old DFARS, 252-204-7012, uh, uh, affectionately called the 7012 DFAR. And it talks about securing controlled unclassified information. Um, it originally was written in like 2012. Um, but uh, if you go look at that DFAR today, uh, and I did yesterday, uh, it went into effect, it became effective December 31st of last year. Now, the Pentagon, after a lot of gnashing of teeth on the part of defense contractors, has said, well, you know, if you're not fully compliant, we're probably not going to go off and beat you up too badly. Uh, you know, make sure you have a plan and you're actively working on that plan. But at some point in time, in the relatively near future, they're going to go off and say, hey, you just need to be compliant. And nobody knows when because, in theory, the DFAR is already in effect. So, you know, while obviously unclassified computers better not contain classified information, as we see with things like Sea Dragon and other programs, um, they clearly contain sensitive information um, and they contain valuable social engineering data. Um, one example that we saw recently became public was a, a colonel at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, the place where they manage the drones in the Middle East. They find the drones out of Creech. Um, he uh, apparently took home a maintenance manual for a Reaper MQ, which is about a $20 million drone, and put it on his home computer. I, I don't know whether that is a violation of rules or not, but if it's not, it certainly should be. But what happened was that uh, his uh, home network router had a vulnerability in it, um, and hackers who were likely just kind of scouring the net looking for uh, these particular brand and model routers that were known to be compromisable, found this thing, compromised it, logged onto his network, found the maintenance manual, um, and took a copy of it, and they either are or were selling it on the dark net for $150. So you're, you know, if you think about what's in the maintenance manual on a drone, um, likely, um, you know, that would give you some pretty strong insight into the capabilities because you'll know what the hardware components are um, and how it's put together and, and possibly how to defeat it. So, you know, losing that, oh yeah, by the way, as a freebie for your 150 bucks, it would also throw in the list of the maintenance team for uh, repairing and maintaining those drones uh, in Creech. So um, there's an example, another example, another one of many examples of sensitive, uh, unclassified information um, that you know likely fell into the hands of the Chinese because they probably took their stolen credit card and bought a copy of that manual for 150 bucks. Bottom line is that the unclassified systems, and that includes the systems at your vendors, at your subcontractors, and apparently at your employees' personal uh, computers at home, are all attack vectors and are all under attack. Recently in May, the uh, Pentagon said, um, you know, one of the challenges we're having with this controlled unclassified information implementation program 
is that um, nobody's in charge. So uh, they kind of looked around and tried to figure out um, who was the best uh, candidate to, to stick with this task. And they decided that the Defense Security Service was the right answer. And DSS, and I tend to agree with this, DSS, you know, obviously they handle clearances, they handle um, uh, classified information. So, you know, adding sensitive unclassified information, you know, that probably makes a lot of sense. They already, you know, if they happen across uh, sensitive unclassified information as they're doing their classified work, um, you know, they do talk to contractors about that. But now they're going to have a whole division whose only job is to go off and work with the defense industrial base and and deal with the um, uh, controlled, unclassified information. So our friends at DSS are probably going to be paying you a visit in the next you know, few months and to talk about uh, controlled, unclassified information. So what do you do now? Well, you know, basically, there's not a lot of flexibility in all this. What there is to do now at this point is to get yourself a copy of 8171, which is the kind of the Bible of uh, going off and, and implementing this uh, controlled uh, unclassified information program that is uh, defined in 7012 and uh, implement it. And I'm going to talk in a whole, I'm going to slice and dice this in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, there's, you know, kind of limited ability to adapt this but the ability is really pretty limited. It's pretty much one size fits all. And that's a challenge, right? Um, you know, mid last year, the Pentagon uh, went out and talk, didn't go out. They brought contractors in and they uh, talked about uh, 7012 and 8171. And they said, you know, we're not in the short term going to beat you up too badly if you have not fully implemented 800 But if you don't tell us the truth about where you stand, well, that, my dears, is a completely different story. So, um, you know, they're not going to go out on a witch hunt, but they expect you to comply and they expect you to tell you where it is that you're not um, meeting the requirements. Um, so, you know, this is the whole thing, right? If you think about the way that works, right, you're going to go off and say, that you are compliant. And if you lie about it, that's not a thing the government likes a whole lot. So if you go back to the original version of 7012, it goes back to, it was originally signed in 2013, it was written in 2012, but there were versions in 2015, a couple of versions, 2016, and finally 2017 is when it went into effect. Uh, the title is called Safeguarding Covered Defense Information and cyber incident reporting. So it talks about both protecting and reporting, and I'll talk about both of those as we move forward in this uh, program. So a lot of this is based on Executive Order 13556, uh, which dates back to 2010. The idea of 556 was to go off and get people to uh, standardize on the nomenclature we saw across different agencies, different departments, civilian and defense, that they had like well over 100 different labels for sensitive unclassified information. And, um, you know, it became very, very difficult for anybody to figure out how they were going to go protect something if you didn't even know what it was called. So this uh, regulation, 556, um, goes off and appoints NARA, the National Archives, uh, as the executive agent to go implement it and try to rein in all these different labels for the same thing or relatively the same thing. And the reason why people created all these different labels is because they said, well, you know, our stuff is a little different than your stuff, so, you know, we're going to call it different and, and treat it differently. But the problem is that it makes it almost impossible for anybody to go figure out how to go protect it if you don't even know what it's called. When I said adapt earlier, here's here's where adapt comes in. So the regulation says that alternative but equally effective measures submitted in writing, that would be to your CO, um, and, and then uh, forwarded up to the chief information officer of the DOD, will be adjudicated. And adjudicated means that they'll kind of look at it and they will make a decision, they're going to come back and say, well, why can't you just do what we asked you to do? If this is equivalent, 
why can't you just do what you asked us to do? And, you know, pretty much that's going to be a hard thing to answer. So I don't expect that there's going to be a lot of approvals of uh, equally effective measures. But, you know, maybe you have a situation where that makes sense and, um, you know, they will approve that. But understand that there's a bureaucracy you're going to have to go through if you want to do that. Now, this is really an important aspect of things. Um, everybody uses the cloud today. Microsoft Cloud, Amazon, Google, as well as you know, a zillion other cloud vendors. Um, if you use the cloud and it uh, is used to protect um, controlled unclassified information, then that cloud vendor must be must implement the security requirements of FedRAMP moderate um, because that's what we're saying is necessary to go off and do. So you know if you're using, especially if you're using you know traditional consumer grade stuff, and you want to uh, you know store controlled unclassified information, that's probably going to be a no no. That's probably just not an option. Um, one of the places where some customers, at least the ones that were Microsoft centric wanted to go was uh, Microsoft's GovCloud. And uh, GovCloud uh, is FedRAMP certified, uh, but it had a requirement up until earlier this year of at least 100 users from a single customer. That has now been rescinded, and now there's no size restriction. So for those smaller primes and subs that don't have 100 people uh, or, or don't have 100 people who are going to be using a cloud-based product, you can still get things into GovCloud. And remember, that in order to get into GovCloud, I don't care who it is, Amazon or Microsoft, whoever, you need a letter from your contracting officer <clears throat> saying that you have a requirement to be in GovCloud. So let's talk about some of the specifics of what's required. First thing we're gonna talk about is incidents, because everybody has incidents. Hopefully not very many, but everybody has incidents. Um, so the first thing is that you have to report within 72 hours, any incident, and you have to report that to your prime if you're a sub, and also to the DOD. So that's not a long time, and you need to have at least some basic information about what's going on by the time you report that. So um, this is not just, hey, we had a problem, uh, we'll get back to you later. No, you gotta have some information on what's going on. So uh, we'll talk about what uh, probably is necessary in order to achieve that to be able to do that effectively. Second thing is that when you discover uh, that there was malware involved in the incident, obviously, you know, some incidents are pretty simple, right? There's no malware. It's just, well, someone left the door unlocked. Um, you know, so there's no malware there. But in many cases, you know, someone will click on something, they'll download malware, and the DOD wants a copy of it. So you've got to figure out how to go off and bag and tag that malware and send it to the DOD Cyber Crime Center. Um, and they said, you know, please don't send it to the Prime. Prime's got enough malware already. They don't need any more. So just send it to the DOD. But that means, again, you have to have a program and figure out how to do this because you don't want to try to do this on the fly. Next thing is, and this is all related to what happens during an incident, and this actually culminates in something, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, you have to preserve and protect uh, the systems that were involved. So let's say, you know, there were, you know, five workstations and three servers and, um, uh, you know, maybe some storage devices that were all involved in this incident. And obviously the number could be a whole bunch bigger than that. So you've got to have a way to go off and, and, and basically forensically soundly, that means something that you can testify in court of law, that you've managed a chain of custody that you can, you can uh, swear under oath that this image that you created of that system is in fact an exact identical copy of that system at the time of the event. So again, you gotta have a program there. Uh, that also means you have to package up and bag and tag all relevant log files. And, and if you have packet captures, uh, packet captures as well, and you gotta preserve all that for at least 90 days so the DOD has time to come in and say, hey, Oh yeah, we need a copy of that stuff. Um, and of course, here's you know a, a CYA. This doesn't absolve you of any other requirements that you have to have in terms of protecting information. This is a 
mandatory, this whole 7012 requirement is a mandatory flow down clause with no changes to all subcontracts. And actually, it's a little bit narrower than that. All subcontracts where there is controlled and classified information uh, transmitted to the subcontractor. So if you're dealing with controlled and classified information, and let's say you have a, a vendor that's doing some uh, manufacturing or printed circuit boards, and those PCBs are um, contain c controlled and classified information, they now have to follow the same set of rules that you follow, the same set of notifications, and they are effectively a subcontractor to you, and they have to follow the same set of rules in 7012. So uh, you know, bear that in mind when you subcontract things out that should be in the contract so that there isn't any question about it. Okay, so let's talk about what is included in covered defense information. Uh, that's what the term that they refer to it in 7012. So covered defense information includes controlled technical information, which is like probably that Reaper manual that got whacked in Creech, critical program information, which is information that the government thinks is critical but was developed using private dollars, export controlled information, things like uh, ITAR, EAS information, and uh, other information that they say requires safeguarding or dissemination controls. So, you know, how do you know whether it is? Well, you know, clearly things like ITAR, um, you know, that's going to be pretty obvious. The, the ITAR regulations talk about it. CPI. The government's going to have to tell you what category of information uh, that you've developed on your own nickel is CPI. And controlled technical information is information that's provided by the government, so they will tell you that that information is controlled. So what does uh, 800-171 require specifically? And I keep pointing this out, that there's a whole bunch of versions. The one you want is Rev 1, which is dated December 2016, but with the June 7th, 2018 updates. So one of the things that's in that manual for folks that are used to using uh, uh, 800-53 or ISO 27000 series of controls, they are mapping on a control by control basis each of the controls that's in 800-171 to 800-53 and ISO 27001. So you know, here we're talking about for 3.1, 3.2, they're talking about uh, NIST control AC-2 and AC-3 and the ISO controls in A9.2 and um, A9.1 uh, and A6.2. So if that's something that you're used to using, then this is something that may be helpful to you. Now, they also talk about something called NFO, which is uh, non-federal organizations, and these are things that they expect you to already be working on uh, and that they don't have to specify. It says, expect it to be routinely satisfied by a non-federal organization, that's you and me, without having to specify it. So what's on that list? And there's a lot of them. Um, access control policies and procedures, security awareness training, security training records, audit and accountability, security assessment and authorization, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, restriction on external system access and connections. So these are some examples, and there's more coming, of controls that should be in place um, uh, without them having to go off and tell you. Uh, continuous monitoring or independent assessments, internal system connections, uh, configuration management, uh, configuration change control, software usage restriction, and I would point out, of course, that if you have a policy and procedure that they expect you to be following it and to have some, <clears throat> excuse me, control mechanisms in place that um, verify that these things really are being done. More examples of NFO items, uh, identification auth authentication, INA, uh, incident response, system maintenance, policies and procedures, media protection, physical and environmental protection, still going, more coming here, third-party personnel security, risk assessment, vulnerability scanning, developer configuration management, and system monitor. That's the end of the list. So whew, that's a pretty long list. Now, the good news is, and I'm not exactly sure why they call these out, because almost all of these things are already in 800-171. So um, 
maybe they're just saying that, you know, while we're specifying that you have to go do this, we kind of sort of expect that you're already doing this at least to some degree. So um, bear that in mind and bear in mind that having a policy and procedure and but not following the policy and procedure probably does not earn you any brownie points whatsoever. So specifically, what's in 800-171? Well, there's 14 sections, and as I said, 110 requirements. None of these requirements are optional. They're all mandatory. Uh, and these controls come from 800-53 moderate. So those of you, again, who are in the, in the uh, classified world who are used to doing uh, baselines based on 800-53, that's where this comes from, and also FIPS 200. So. Um, for folks that are used to the classified world, this is not going to come as a huge shock other than you've never had to do it before. So what are the 14 sections? Well, here they are. Um, I'm just going to read them real quick, but they are access control, awareness and training, audit and accountability, configuration management, INA, incident response, maintenance, media protection, personnel security, physical protection, risk assessment, security assessment, system and communication protection, and system and information integrity. So these are the basic things that you expect to see. Um, they obviously go into some detail uh, in these controls by the time they're done. But I mean, there's nothing here which is rocket science. It's just a lot of work. The big thing is that for many organizations, this is going to require a change to the way things have been done. That's the important part of this. There is no exemption for smaller contractors, subs or primes, and there is no extension past December 31st of 2017. I actually looked last night to see if they snuck in a change in the DFAR on me and changed the date. They did not. The DFAR still says effective date, December 31, 2017. So especially for smaller primes and subs, this is going to be uh, some work to go do. Again, no rocket science. Clearly, significant changes in the way you do things, um, and probably um, you know some additional manpower to maintain and ensure these things are being done. So, um, not uh, minimizing anything here in terms of what's required to get there, but not rocket science. All known art. We have seen letters from Prime's two subs that scared the bejesus out of those subs, asking the CEO of the sub to go off and sign that they are in compliance, and these went out last year, which is why it says will be, uh, in compliance by December 31st of 2017. And if they are not in compliance, it goes off and says, hey, you know, tell us where you're not in compliance and how you plan to get into compliance. Um, remember that the primes are the ones who are going to get whacked the hardest by DOD. So they're ultimately responsible. So if you're Lockheed Martin, you have 5,000 or 10,000 subs, you know, it is DOD's intention uh, on purpose to have you be on the hook for what your subs are doing. That will motivate you to go off and make sure the subs are doing things right, and it will motivate you to monitor what they're doing. So, you know, you're certainly welcome to lie and sign, uh, but I really don't recommend that you do that. And if you're thinking about do that, uh, doing that, you might want to read up on disbarment uh, because that's where you're going. So let's look at some very specific examples of 800-171 requirements. First one I'm going to talk about, 316, uh, is talks about the use of non-privileged accounts when accessing non-security functions. So let me give you an example of that. Pretty, pretty simple. You have an IT administrator and they have an account with administrative privileges and they use that while they're reading their email or doing their daily work or whatever they're doing. Likely, they do not need to have administrative privileges to read their email. In fact, one way that I have found to be very effective to discourage users from going off and using privileged accounts for non-privileged functions is to limit the capabilities. For example, if you do not allow email on the privileged account, or you do not allow web surfing on the, the privileged account, people will go off and whine a lot. Yes, they'll do that, I know that. But they will not use that privileged account very much because it's gonna be a pain in the tush and they're not gonna to wanna to do that. So 
that's a good way to go off and discourage people from using privileged accounts with us. So, and remember, this is not just the operating system privilege. This includes network privileges, firewall privileges, application privileges, anytime you're doing privileged functions. 331. Um, if you have an event, you want to be able to go off and detect what happened. <clears throat> In fact, you have an obligation to tell DOD within 72 hours that there was an event and here is what happened. The only possible way that you might be able to do that would be to go off and have good audit records. So you got to go look at what it is you have and don't have and um, how you're protecting those. Remember, you need to be able to provide those in a forensically sound way. So, um, you know, if you're not protecting those records, if you're not preserving them, then that's a, that's a problem. You know, DOD wants you to be able to go pick that in that hermetically sealed bag and ship that off to the Pentagon or whoever they want you to ship it off to so that they can go look at that. So you need to have enough audit data to be able to investigate what happened. So just kind of ponder that and think about what you're collecting right now and think about whether or not what you have right now is sufficient to go off and be able to investigate uh, any unlawful, unauthorized, or inappropriate activity. So you don't know whether it's unlawful, unauthorized, or inappropriate until you investigate, and you can't investigate if you don't have the appropriate log information. So it's kind of a circular situation, but think about that. 353, multi-factor authentication. So number one use of multi-factor authentication is for local access to a privileged account. Local means, does not mean in the same building. Local means when you're sitting in front of the keyboard of the device and there's no network involved. That's what they mean by local. It also includes network access, which means local or remote network access to privileged accounts. So if you have a system administrator or an application administrator and they are going off and doing that from the computer at their desk, which likely they are, you need to have multi-factor authentication. There's lots of different ways. They don't, they don't specify which one of the many different ways of implementing multi-factor authentication you're using. So that's a good thing. Uh, that's left with you. And certainly for all remote access, then for sure that needs to have um, multi-factor authentication as well. 361, um, and I can't harp on this one enough, incident response. You've got to have a mechanism to respond to instance. We have a client who had an incident recently. Um, they, uh, because they have good audit records and good controls uh, and good alerting, they um, heard about it one morning, uh, a little bit before first shift, and they were able to go off and identify what happened. They were able to go off and figure out what was taken. And, and be able to mitigate the damage all within a period of about two and a half hours. And they're saying, you know, two and a half hours is good. That's a good thing. Uh, but we want to be able to do it quicker. So incident response, and there's a lot of stuff, and I'm going to talk some more about incident response in a little bit. But incident response is a key component. Um, and most people do not have effective incident response programs. Um, 375 talks about a different use of multi-factor authentication. That is, if you have a third party who you need to grant access temporarily to your network in order to do some kind of maintenance, that access must be protected by multi-factor authentication. So if you have a, a copier vendor, because the copier is sitting on the network, uh, who wants to be able to connect to the copier to go look at it, and sometimes they do that, for example, even to... Um, go off and read page counts and stuff at the end of the month, that has to be protected by two-factor authentication. And that connection must be terminated uh, when the uh, maintenance is complete. 311.1 talks about periodically assessing the risk to, uh, or the organization, and that is a broad risk. It's, you can't go off and look at this narrowly. This is not an IT problem. This is an overall organizational risk assessment. And think about it as you know, any possible way that this controlled unclassified information could be compromised. Um, and, and you've got to do that on a periodic basis. The periodic, to us, our interpretation periodic is at least annually. 
312.3 talks about uh, monitoring security controls on an ongoing basis. You know, you would not be the first organization, I bet, to go off and discover that some sysadmin disabled some control because they were doing some maintenance. And golly gee, I forgot to go re-enable it. And it's been three months since I forgot to re-enable it. So you got to have monitoring mechanism in place to make sure that the controls that you say that you're doing really are happening. 313.7, um, for people that are remotely connecting to the network, uh, there's a concept called split tunneling. What that means is that the user has the ability to both access the local internet connection as well as the company network. That now is a no-no. People will whine a whole lot unless for some reason you're already in a position where you've implemented uh, no split tunneling. Uh, but if you haven't done that, people will whine, and the answer is tough nuggies, not an option. Go back, do your job, quit complaining. Okay, so let me take at a high level what I think are some of the key takeaways from this. Um, you need to conduct annual risk assessments at the enterprise level. Our recommendation is third party because third parties don't have a dog in a fight. It must cover the entire enterprise. And oh yeah, it must take into consideration all the cloud and SaaS vendors that you're using because they are a huge risk component to the thing, to the overall system. You also need to scan for and remediate vulnerabilities. I, I don't even want to talk about the things that we find when we do scans for clients. It's pretty amazing. So that's something that you got to go do and you got to do, do it at least annually. And then, oh yeah, by the way, you better uh, bleeping go off and fix the things that were identified as vulnerabilities in the risk assessment. I have you know, folks that come to us and say, yeah, here's this risk assessment we did last year. We haven't done anything about any of the things that they found, but you know, we did the risk assessment. Well, um, you might get a few brownie points for doing a risk assessment. You're not going to get very many. And you're certainly going to lose a lot of brownie points for not fixing the things that they found in the last risk assessment. So I've already talked twice about cyber incident response programming generally, but I'm going to talk about it again because it's really, really critical. So what is in a cyber incident response program? Well, obviously, you've got to have a policy. Uh, and the policy is pretty simple. It says you'll have a cyber incident response program and, and, and stuff like that. It's pretty simple. You will have uh, procedures, um, but that's, that's the documentation part. But the next part is it's got to be staffed. People need to know that they are part of the incident response program, and they need to know what their role is in that incident response program. They have to be trained. And the incident response program has to be tested uh, at, at least annually. And you can do that using sort of virtual tabletop exercises. Um, but you got to do that at least annually because otherwise people just will completely forget. You know, and our recommendation, by the way, is you got to have at least a copy, preferably more than one, of the program documentation in a big red binder at your desk because, oh yeah, possibly your computer might not work when you need it at the most. The program also includes, in addition to insiders, it also includes third parties. So think about it, you might have a forensics firm. You might have a cybersecurity consulting firm like us as part of your incident response team. You may have a crisis communication team, the perfect example of not having a crisis communication team that's trained was the Equifax breach when their marketing people sent people to a website to find out whether they were affected. Uh, oh yeah, uh, oops, it was the wrong website. And oh yeah, the website was stood up by an outside contractor after the breach because they didn't think about setting one up. And the website was not owned by Equifax. So people said, huh, it's kind of weird. You want me to log on to where? Who is this company that you're asking me to log on to? It, had, it didn't have the Equifax name in it anywhere. So, you know, outside people, crisis communication, 
outside lawyers. Law, outside lawyers are important because it's the only way that you can invoke attorney-client privilege. Your internal counsel is very unlikely to be able to successfully invoke attorney-client privilege. So document it, staff it, train it, and test it. Can't say that enough. Next piece of the equation is auditing and alerting. You know, our client who was able to detect the uh, incident that they had and and <clears throat> control the spill and mitigate the damage in two and a half hours, they were able to do that because they got alerted. Um, and part of alerting is escalation. So, you know, you're going to have a very core piece of your incident response team that you're going to get together as soon as, you know, you get the first alert. Um and that team needs to have the authority to do what they need to do um, without having to ask permission. <clears throat> I'll give you an example of that. Um, at the time that the Sony breach happened, uh, a few months before that, the Sands Hotel and Entertainment Group was hit with the same kind of attack by a similar group of people. However, you've probably noticed that the Sands breach did not make the news. Why is that? Because uh, Sheldon Adelson, the guy who owns the Sands, um, had a incident response program and had tasked the people on that team with the responsibility of doing what was necessary. So when that team decided that they needed to disconnect the whole freaking Sands organization from the internet, number one, they didn't have to ask anybody. And number two, they actually knew how to do that. Um, a couple of years ago, the city of Denver was hit with a denial of service attack. And after a couple of hours and it wasn't subsiding and their mitigation efforts weren't fixed, uh, wasn't fixing it, they decided to go off and um, uh, disconnect from the internet. And they talk about this. This is not, I'm not ratting them out. Um, it took them two and a half hours to figure out how to disconnect from the internet. Well, you know, that attack continued. Now, the good news was that was only a denial of service attack. So the net effect of that was one where <clears throat> people just couldn't get any work done. There's, there was not continuing damage being done like there was at the Sands or at Sony. Uh, but it took them a long time. So, you know, it took them a while to get permission and it took them a longer while to go off and um, actually figure out how to do it. So escalation is really important. and the people on the team need to be given the training and then given the approval to go off and uh, implement what needs to be implemented without having to go convene a management meeting. Now, yeah, management needs to be kept in a loop. That's important. I understand that. And, and you should do that. But they can't get in the way of dealing with the incident. Okay, next piece of the equation, um, employee training. You know, when the DNC got hacked during the 2016 election, the FBI on three separate occasions contacted DNC to tell them they've been hacked. Uh, I think at one time they talked to a receptionist, another time they talked to the uh, help desk, and I don't remember who they talked to the third time. The people that they talked to thought that it was a prank. And so they dismissed it. They didn't tell anybody. Your people, in terms of training, need to know that the decision to figuring out whether something like that is a prank is above their pay grade. That needs to be forwarded to the incident response team leader and with all relevant information that you might have. And then the incident response team will go figure out what to go do. Now, you know, that being said, so shame on the DNC, problem. Um, the FBI, their headquarters is about a mile and a half from the headquarters of the DNC. You know, they certainly could have walked down the street, you know, walked in the, in the front door, flashed their big shiny badge and said, I want to talk to the guy in charge. They didn't do that either. So, you know, the, the FBI bears some responsibility for, for things not going down the way they should. But, you know, training, you know, uh, human being related attacks, phishing attacks, spear phishing attacks, business email compromise, those kind of attacks. They're a huge component of, of compromises and, um, and training is really critical. And, and right now, you know, training 
is uh, affordable, it's online, it's fully contained, it includes um, anti-phishing training as well. I mean, a product that we sell uh, sells for less than 20 bucks a seat per year. And it, um, you know, I just, yesterday I sent out a notice about what's new this week. It now has 692 different training modules to choose from. And that's, you know, in addition to that, you have all the anti-phishing stuff, but, but 692 training modules to choose from um, is pretty impressive selection. You go pick what was appropriate for you, but you got to train people, just got to do it. Patching, you know, we go, I'll go beat up Equifax some more, right? You know, the, the uh, uh, problem in Equifax was caused by a vulnerability in Apache struts. Um, and that vulnerability was not patched on some number of servers. And the hackers who just said, hey, you know, we know about this Apache struts vulnerability. Let's just kind of wander around the, the big old internet, see if we can find servers that haven't been patched. And lo and behold, they found some servers at Equifax. And now, by the way, this week, Apache Struts 2 is back in another vulnerability, and um, it is being actively exploited. And, and one thing to understand is um, you got to understand the components that your vendors are using. So, for example, you know, some of our clients, you know, talk to them about Apache Struts. They say, well, you know, we're not developing software. We don't use Apache Struts. Well, maybe that's true, but maybe that's not so true. You use any Cisco software? Some of that uses Apache Struts. What about Oracle Financials? Yep, Apache Struts. Um, there's a whole bunch of products. VMware, yep, it uses it too in some of their products. So, um, you know, you got to understand what's under the covers from your vendors because um, you may not think you're using something when in fact you are. That's a whole other conversation called software supply chain. Configuration management. You got to put some controls in place. You know, I think we're pretty good about putting controls in place when it comes to um, classified systems, but we're not so good when it comes to tracking and controlling changes, approving changes when it comes to unclassified systems. You got to prevent the use of non essential programs. You've got to make sure that people do not install unapproved software because software that you don't know about, you're not likely to patch. And you got to analyze the security impact of those changes. So that's a lot of work. I'm not not uh, you know downsizing that at all. That's that's a lot of work. But you got to go off and go do that. Removal media. Removal media is still a huge problem, especially on unclassified systems. People love to stick flash drives into things, and ignoring the fact that flash drives might be infected, people also lose flash drives all the time. So our our uh, recommendation is to encrypt removable media. We use a product called Apricorn. They make a hardware encryption-based solution uh, for both flash drives and other USB disk drives. Uh, the reason why that's uh, good is that uh, all of the encryption process takes place on the flash drive or on the USB disk drive itself so that it is not exposed to vulnerabilities in the software. So if you have a compromised Windows computer or Linux computer, um, that computer does not have the ability to get the encrypted encryption key. Now, obviously, if you plug, if you decrypt the disk, you know, by putting in the pin and you plug it into a system, then during that period during which it's unencrypted and connected to the system, they can look at that data. But they cannot go off and compromise the encryption key itself. And of course, you got to sanitize removable media before you throw it away, which doesn't happen. People say, oh, this flash drive doesn't work, and they chuck it in the garbage, and they don't think twice about what might be on that. By the way, um, think about your copiers and printers. Almost all of those using the enterprise have hard disks in them. And that means anything that you copied is likely still on that hard disk. So ponder that for a minute. Mobile is definitely the problem child. And I'm talking about when I'm talking about mobile, I'm not talking so much about laptops. We've got that sort of kind of under control. I'm talking about phones and tablets. Now if we talk about if we compare iPhones and Androids, iPhones have the ability to be a lot more secure in part because there's only one manufacturer of iPhones and they tend to be uh, pretty naggy about doing things like installing updates. You know with Android phones, there's a lot of Android phones out there. 
that vendors have stopped issuing patches for them. And I got to tell you, you know, the, really the only reasonable, safe thing to go do is say if you're running an old Android phone for which you're not getting regular patches, sorry, you can't connect to the corporate network. You can't get email. You can't, you can't access controlled and classified information on that device. Um, you know, and you got to think about it. some of these attacks for mobile don't even require that you connect. All you have to do is be within radio range, like crack for Wi-Fi, blueborn for Bluetooth. All you have to do is be within radio range. That is enough to go off and um, uh, allow a hacker to compromise a vulnerable system. Vendor cyber risk management, I can't talk about enough. Um, you know, you got to worry about anybody that you share, just like the prime has to worry about the sub, you have to worry about anybody that you sub things out to. So for example, if you have a company that's doing contract manufacturing, and as a result of that contract manufacturing, uh, they have access to CUI, then they have to follow the same set of procedures that you follow. Um, so you know, part of that is you got to know who you're sharing data with and who has access to your systems. And one way to do that, there's a product that we sell called BitSight. It's a great product. It gives you an indication, kind of like a credit score. A low credit score does not mean that uh, you're going to default on a loan, but a low credit score means that the probability of you having problems paying your loan uh, are going to be uh, greater than someone with a higher credit score. So that's what BitSight does, and it works great in terms of, of, of helping you manage the credit score on your vendors or the security score. Um, do not give admin privileges if you can possibly avoid it, local or domain. If you have to give it, then that requires a separate account, and a separate account shouldn't have email access uh, or internet access. Um, and you gotta audit all those access control lists because you gotta know uh, whether or not these things are really current and whether they really are correct. Vendor data inventory is the root core component of the vendor cyber risk management program. So uh, that is a complete list of all third parties that you provide data to, that you receive data from, that their application, like a web page, processes your data, or maybe they have access to your systems. All those guys, now, now you go off and, and look at them and you rate them in terms of high, medium, and low risk. And then you go off and figure out whether or not their cybersecurity practices meet your requirements. If they're not, then either you tell them they got to clean, clean up their act or the other alternative is you find another vendor. We, we help with all these things. So, you know, if this is all like overwhelming, then just reach out to us and we can set up a program to go help you become compliant. But it's, uh, you can't just hope it's going to go away because it's not going to go away. Sorry this time it's not going away there is no easy solution i understand it's it's tough especially for smaller organizations you know and we we understand that you know in the classified world we're used to you know the government going off and making all these demands on us uh we're not used to that in the unclassified world well we're gonna have to get used to it that's just kind of the way that's going to work now part of this is that uh there's an intersection between uh, security and convenience and the challenge there is that you know we've done things for the most part to be convenient because that way employees don't complain very much uh, and it's easier and maybe it's less expensive although you know a lot of this stuff doesn't invoke any expense at all it's just process and procedure once you get it done it's, it basically costs you the same as <clears throat> doing it the non-secure way um but people like convenience. And so, you know, now we're in a situation where we're going to have to go off and say, sorry, uh, convenience is nice, but you know, we're dealing with national security here. We're dealing with the theft of intellectual property. We're dealing with our dominance in the world. And uh, in some cases, security is going to win out over um, convenience. So core documents here we've talked about already. Uh, you know, down there in the red box, you notice in the tiny, itty bitty little letters in the bottom, it says includes updates as of 6 7 2018. That's the version that you want. There's also um, a companion document called 800 171A, 
And that talks about how do you go off and do this audit? So if you go look at HR 171A, they've taken each of the controls and they've said, okay, here is the requirement. Here is the objective. So like, for example, in the case of um, uh, 3.1.1, they say the objective is to make sure that authorized users are identified, to make sure that processes acting on behalf of authorized users are identified, it goes on and on, right? And then it talks about, for, again, for each one of these controls, the potential assessment methods and objects. So for example, you can select from access control policies, procedures addressing account management, system security plans, and on and on. So they give you, you know, here's the things you can go look at. Um, they're, they're telling you, you know, here's the kind of people that you might want to go off and interview. And here's how you test to make sure that things are actually going the way people say. So they do this for each one of the 100 plus controls. And, um, you know, if you have a question about how to comply or if you're compliant, you can go look at 800-171-A and go off and implement that. Um, <laughs> for those people who haven't seen a system security plan, and that's going to be obviously the non-cleared contractors, um, I hope there aren't any cleared contractors that don't know what an SSP is. Uh, there's also a copy of a form for a system security plan. And there's also a form for POAM. Again, every contractor I am sure is painfully familiar with a POAM plan of action with milestones uh, for mitigating the things that are not done yet. So this is 800-171-A is kind of a cookbook that gives you the tools to help you go off and manage that process. Um, Handbook 162 is a supplement for uh, the manufacturing community uh, that NIST did. It doesn't have any different requirements, but it does explain things differently uh, for manufacturing folks because they're not used to cybersecurity. So uh, now I will uh, take questions if there are any. Um, and you know, feel free to reach out to me. Here's my name and number um, and email address. Also, we put out a weekly cybersecurity newsletter. So if you're interested in being on that newsletter list, uh, send us an email and we'll go off and do that for you. Um, so with that, um, thank you for your attendance and um, you know, have a safe and secure day. <laughs>